want to talk to you today about bipolar depression. Now, bipolar depression is defined paradoxically by the fact that it's depression that occurs in association with mood elevation. This slide shows you that there is a spectrum of problems relating to mood elevation, so that if you look on the left of this slide, you see patients who are unipolar, who experience only depression and never mood elevation. And to the far right of this slide, you see patients who experience extremes of mood elevation, and they are called bipolar one or manic depressive psychosis in the traditional literature. You can see that depression occurs across this spectrum and the important issue is whether or not the treatment should be the same for unipolar patients, those are patients on the left of the slide, and bipolar one patients to the right of the slide. Now, if it were simply those two diagnoses, life would be relatively straightforward. The problem is that we also have to consider two intermediate kinds of diagnosis. Depression that occurs either in association with hypomania, which is mood elevation short of mania, not usually leading itself to major problem, and that's called bipolar 2 disorder, and a further spectrum of people who experience primarily depression but will also give you a history of mood elevation which is either shorter than conventional definitions of hypomania or milder. And these patients are often described as having bipolar not otherwise specified. Now what we know best about in terms of treatment are the extremes of this spectrum. In other words, the people with unipolar disorder on the one hand, usually treated with antidepressants, and patients with bipolar 1 disorder on the other. And the approach to their treatment is a little different, and I'm going to show you exactly how in the next slide. Now, the recommendations for bipolar depressive episodes, and this is data primarily but not exclusively from bipolar 1 cases, there are also a number of bipolar 2 patients included in these studies, recommend currently that we should consider three basic options in treating a depressive episode. The first of these is probably now quetiapine. Quetiapine was introduced as an antipsychotic that turns out to be unusually, perhaps even surprisingly effective in treating bipolar depressive episodes. And it's also effective against unipolar depressive episodes as well. The second option is lamotrigine. Lamotrigine is originally an anticonvulsant. Uh, its mechanism action is, in terms of its relation to depression, is not well established, but it certainly has a good reputation for use particularly in bipolar 2 disorder where the risk of a manic recurrence is less, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Finally, we also find that many patients with bipolar disorder are treated with antidepressants. And this is an area of some controversy, which I'll explain in a moment, but it's worth bearing in mind because it's an extremely common practice. Whether it's absolutely the right practice remains an open question. Now, those are the indications for moderate to severe episodes of depression. If one has particularly refractory, particularly psychotic, or a history of response to ECT, then ECT or electroconvulsive therapy should be considered for people with severe intractable or psychotic bipolar depression. There's good evidence for its efficacy and it is often available, but that depends somewhat on the local culture within which you probably work. Finally, the role of psychotherapy in bipolar disorder, bipolar depression specifically, has been very little investigated. There is one major study that suggests that, in fact, almost any sort of psychotherapy, that is family-focused therapy, which involves family members specifically, uh, interpersonal rhythm therapy, which concentrates very much on activities in daily living, and finally, even CBT, standard cognitive behavior therapy, all help to speed response to in a depressive episode that's been treat, also treated pharmacologically. So there is a role for psychotherapy, but it would be fair to say that its place is rather less established in bipolar depression than in unipolar depression. Now, I talked a little bit about the issue of antidepressants, and antidepressants are the main controversy. You would think it perfectly logical to use antidepressants to treat 
a depressive episode in bipolar disorder because there is very little to distinguish uh, the symptoms of depression when patients are bipolar from the depressions that people get who are unipolar. So it would seem logical that patients would respond to antidepressants. It's logical, but there is the potential of additional risks in bipolar patients. And they are, first of all, a switch to mania. Now, if you have a switch to mania, in response to a res if you have a response to in the depressive phase and a switch to mania, that can be something of a disaster for the patient. So there can be a lot of unforeseen consequences that result from manic episode, a lot of potential danger to the patient, and it's something that we we'll want to avoid. And there is certainly some evidence that when you use tricyclic antidepressants or dual action drugs like duloxetine, then the vaccine, then there is an increased risk that patients will switch into a manic episode directly during their recovery from depression. The second risk, which is also uh, widely written about, although the evidence for it is a little less good in fact, is that patients may not just switch into mania, but they may switch into a relatively shallow, that is hypermanic, but persistent rapid cycling state. And the association with the use of antidepressants and rapid cycling is something that is widely observed, and the causation is often inferred to be the use of antidepressants. It's rather difficult to prove that, and it turns out that when you stop antidepressants, it's not always the case that the rapid cycling stops. In fact, it's quite unusual for the cycling to stop. So there remains an uncertainty about this relationship, but it's a further reason for caution when you absolutely actually want to use an antidepressant to treat bipolar depression. The final, uh, if you like, the final wrinkle here is that usually one associates this risk of switch with starting an antidepressant, but it also appears to occur when one stops an antidepressant. And that's something that's by no means well understood, but it's been sufficiently often observed to be plausible uh, as a fact. Finally, let's just notice that this uncertainty is down to an absence of adequate investigation. There have simply been too few studies looking at the response over adequate time periods of bipolar depressed patients to antidepressants using sufficient appropriate controls. And where there's an absence of evidence, there's almost always a difference of opinion. And so when you read about this, you'll find those differences of opinion very widely stated. If we sum them up, it would be, I think, that in the United States, there's generally a feeling that we should not use antidepressants, whereas in Europe, we tend to be more liberal and we tend to use antidepressants when we clearly have a patient who remains chronically depressed. Now, the treatment of depression in an episode is obviously a first step. The second step is the long-term treatment of recurrent depression. And what you can see on this slide is that we have a number of further choices to consider in terms of drug treatment, and there are in additional issues relating to psychotherapy, which I will mention briefly. The drug treatment that is available includes lithium, which has been shown actually to reduce the risk of suicide, which is almost a unique observation for any treatment within psychiatry. Lamotrigine, which is also a potent uh, pre uh, preventer of relapse in bipolar depression, both one and bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, and quetiapine. So we have a, 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 a choice between those three medications. Antidepressants remain controversial. Some people would argue there is really no evidence to support long-term use of antidepressants. There is some naturalistic evidence to show that some people do okay. And the difficulty is that relapse prevention studies are a nightmare to do. They take a long time, they take many resources, and therefore we have a very greatly limited database on which to make judgments. Finally, there's an important unmet need in bipolar depression. And that relates to the systems that persist between episodes. The emphasis that we've had so far is on either treating acute episodes or preventing long-term relapse of into new episodes. What I want to mention now is the fact that patients with bipolar disorder experience significant levels of symptoms between episodes. And we can illustrate that by asking our patients to rate themselves on standard scales for mood elevation or depression. <coughs> 
once a week uh, and return them to us electronically, either through email or by SMS. And we've done that now for a number of years in my centre, and we have good experience of this. And I'll show you on this final slide the records from a patient over about four years. Now, this is a bipolar one patient, and what you can see is on the top uh, of these, um, this slide, the scale in red shows the ratings for mood elevation. And you'll see that they vary uh, over the course of this period and they're stratified to show the different symptoms that occur over that time. On the bottom scale, you can see the same thing in blue and green for depressive symptoms. And this allows you to see, if you combine them in the middle of this slide, the variation in mood, the increases and decreases in elevated mood, or the increase in decrease in depressed mood, that characterize the long-term state of this individual's mood. And it's this it's the unmet need. We currently don't address ourselves because we don't measure this inter-episode mood variation. And this is a tremendous target for future innovation of treatment, both using medications or using psychological interventions that would help to reduce this particular burden to the patients and indeed to the people who they care about. Thank you very much for your attention.